Well, Dr. Shadow, thank you so much for joining us at Fletcher. And I was wondering if you could just speak a little bit about your research into soft power and the tools of soft power and the uh, speech that you'll be giving today with the International Security Luncheon. Sure. Um, well, essentially, I came to this m more from watching over the past 10 years the problems that the United States has had in integrating the civil-military relationship on the ground in Iraq and Afghanistan and all of the areas in terms of um, the, the counterinsurgency related areas of population security and reconstruction and development and all of our the soft so-called soft power mm -hmm. side of, of that relationship so I've been looking and that's really where my expertise is more and I began to think to myself well really what are what are our instruments of power our, our non-military instruments of power and maybe a little bit cynically or a little bit um, Maybe a little bit cynically, I began to say, do, do we even have any <laughs> instruments of power that, that are not military? While people complain about the militarization of American foreign policy, um, it's also become increasingly clear how difficult it's been to get civilian agencies to be able to um, influence the outcomes we want, for, for lots of reasons. Money, partly, but not just money, also organizations and mindsets, uh, bureaucratic interests, a whole host of, of reasons. So that was sort of the background. I'm not an expert in soft power, and I haven't written on soft power, but I began from that perspective, and then I began to think, well, really, what makes the military different from the civilian agencies? And it seems to me a key difference is looking at the world in a more competitive way, understanding that even in areas where we're not in conflict or at war, there are different kinds of competitions going on. And fundamentally, and this I'm sure I'm looking forward to the discussion later because not everyone will agree, but fundamentally that mindset does not really exist in non-military agencies. And I think actually that then is the fundamental weakness of the way that we approach so-called soft power or smart, smart power. I like smart power a little bit better, but even smart power, it just takes soft power says we need, need, we need to use it together with the military, and that doesn't fix the problem on the soft side, essentially. Mm -hmm. it, it, so I think smart power is actually not, um, also not, doesn't address what, what I'm planning to talk about, the idea of how you operate in competitive environments. And as I'll talk about today, most areas of the world in which we want to operate and seek to influence, even building schools, uh, development aid, working on economic issues, rule of law, all of the issues that traditionally the United States does in its foreign policy arm. In virtually all of those areas, there are local contests going on. And I think that we need to think more smartly about that. I think we need to ask ourselves why we're hesitant in the civilian uh, communities to embrace that idea, to even embrace the idea of intelligence. The idea of intelligence is also associated with the military as opposed to having adequate information so we can operate effectively in these places. So these are the sorts of ideas and that's, I'm not an expert, it, this is an idea I'm putting forward. Um, I have some ideas which we'll talk about, about how we might change uh, civilian agencies to think this way. And I think, you know, there's certainly, there's room for follow-up thinking, but I wanted to introduce the concept. And are there any case studies that you use, whether historical or contemporary, to assess this issue? Well, I try to give examples of the contests going on around the world. And I think it's actually pretty easy to come up with examples. In Egypt, it's obvious. Everything is being contested there. Ideas, ideas about politics, ideas about the economy, ideas about women in society. Even within the Muslim Brotherhood, that in itself is a contest, and then also in the larger society. In, in Tunisia, um, contests about the direction of the society. Even building a girls' school in Afghanistan is not, creates adversaries, I mean, not, not enemies, but they're, they're, you're, you're impacting local politics. So um, I think it's also important as an aside, it's not that they're enemies, it's just that there are contests going on about ideas. Mm -hmm. And you need to convince, you need to understand who who, where the opposition might come from, the level of opposite, opposition, and think about a strategy to overcome that. Um, Pakistan, everything about Pakistan is contested today, both internally and externally. 
um, Latin America also, their, their forces now in, in, in terms of how the governments are likely to be organized and our efforts at institution building, automatically we, we create um, opposition or proponents of our approach just by being there. So it's understanding that landscape better. And I think the community as a whole has understood the need for strategic planning, but I want to inject the idea of competition to it because I think that helps refine where we go with our planning and the purposes for it. So in terms of this competition, structurally, do you think this soft power should be managed by a government agency such as USAID? I just don't. I think soft power is problematic. I, I don't think soft power is, an, is a lever of American influence that we can rely on to achieve our outcomes. Mm -hmm. Soft power is passive. It's, attr it's attractive. It's about attractiveness. Um, Janai has talked about it as such, and I think Professor Schultz later will, will discuss that aspect of it. So I think we need to think more assertively about how we want to influence in the non-military realm. And soft power, as currently conceived, doesn't actually always help us. So I guess it depends what you think of as the tools of soft power. But if it's um, if it's being a good nation, um, sort of upholding human rights when we can, doing the right thing in our own country so that other people look to us as an example, that's great. But I don't think that that often provides a strategy then for how we influence outcomes in Pakistan in a productive way or how we influence outcomes in Egypt in a productive way. I think we need more than that to influence in the non-military realm. Um, so I think it actually, um, I think it only just addresses one component of American power. That's not an original thought. I mean, lots of people have had that thought. But I think we need to push on that a little bit more if we're going to talk about what, you know, what instruments of American power. So that's, um, that's a little bit of my, my talk in a, in a nutshell. Thank and you. I'm sure I'll be you know, criticized, as I, <laughs> as I should be, and, but I'll use those criticisms help me refine, you know, refine my thinking and refine the paper. Well, it's a fascinating subject, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for hosting me. Thank, thank you for hosting you. me. I'm looking forward to the talk. I think it's, yeah. it's just so, it's too easy with soft power to say it's indirect, we can't harness it, yeah. we can't be. It yeah. essentially means we don't want to influence, right. and then we right. can't really respond to criticisms that 